It's Thursday, June 21st, 2018. You're listening to Real Media, amusing ourselves to death. Hi, Cam. Hi. We've got a bit of a different show today, don't we? Yeah, upskirting was big last Friday, and we're using that as a way in to explain how UK politics works. Yep, so the front page headlines are actually all connected now to this story. And we're going to be discussing Christopher Chope and how this leads us on to subjects such as deregulation, child abuse, Brexit, and this kind of cabal at the centre of our politics and how that works. Yeah, um, on the front page of the newspapers today, they're talking about how I think as many OAPs have been killed by AGP in a Harold Shipman-like repetition. I think they said 650 people died because of too much medication, overdoses, Mm -hmm. something like that. And the other big story that's going on at the moment is Brexit. I think in the middle of the week, the House of Lords asked the House of Commons to have a decision on the Brexit deal and the house of commons said that they didn't want it and i think there's been a fudge so that now john burko the speaker the controversial speaker he's the person that will get the veto on the deal i understand that's quite a uh, concentration of power there in one person just for him and so it looks like we're talking about the serial killer for the oaps and burko with brexit And we're getting there from upskirting. Mm -hmm. I think there's... Now, Christopher Chope, you've probably heard his name since the upskirting bill happened. Upskirting, the taking of photos up women's skirts, um, which apparently has become a a practice that lots of men like to engage in, and that so much so that we need a, a law against it. And Christopher Chope's name started being thrown around after he single handedly, again, another concentration of power, stopped this bill. Stop this bill from happening. And that's how we've heard about him. And I think there's a degree of people, when you see this happening, particularly from Tory MPs, this kind of almost sympathetic idea that this, these guys are like old, you know, dinosaurs who, like, maybe this is some weird thing that they have, but generally they must be, um, you know, maybe okay. But Respect, respected, engaged with, understood, perhaps. Exactly, you know, a regular MP, that this might just be one odd thing that he does. But that's really the wrong way to look at this because you've been digging into this precisely because this is kind of one element of the person Chope is. It's the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? Mm. And in some ways, you know, he's tried to make himself out as being a victim and being misunderstood. And in some ways, I would agree that he is, in some ways, his strategies are being misunderstood. But in other ways, it's way worse. He's got off really lightly and what he's doing is way worse. At five o'clock today, the upskirting bill will be presented to the House of Commons by David Gawker, the Justice Minister. And the Conservative Party is using it as an opportunity to say how much they think women should be protected in society against abusive behaviour, and that's all very good. Theresa May said that she was going to push it through anyway, despite this bill being stopped, uh, because there was an interesting interview that she had on Ma at the weekend, didn't she? Yeah, Andrew Marr said, um, this man, Philip um, Chris Chope, has blocked so many other things. Why did you give him a knighthood? And it turns out today in the papers that um, he was nominated for his knighthood by Burko, the speaker. And there was supposed to also be an investigation into Burko bullying his staff, and that was blocked uh, on a committee, three votes to two, and the person with the casting vote was Sir Christopher Chope. So that shows you the way in which they are in bed with each other. The Daily Mail who reported this said that they're not saying that either person knew that... um, the bullying inquiry was going to come up or the other person was going to make him a knight. But um, there's an issue there, especially given that now Burko has a big say over Brexit. Um, But it turns out that Burko and Chope know each other from a long time ago. Um, But before we go there, I just want to say this. I saw a few months ago Chope come up because he's part of Leave Means Leave. So the hard right Brexit And he had put down lots of uh, private members' bills in Parliament to say, um, what, 47 private members' bills, most of them pretty bad, some of them actually not that bad at all, Um, but as a way of getting his his ideas for new laws in through the House of Commons as opposed to um, the government's. 
And I thought, hmm, I can see there's something bad about this guy, but I can't find it at the moment. He used to run Wandsworth Council from 1979 to 1983, and they're famous for being a Tory flagship council with the lowest council tax in the country. Um, in 1983, when he left, he became a MP. And from 1986 to 1990, he was a minister for the environment. Um, and that back then, environment meant local government. And he was steering the poll tax through. When the poll tax happened, Wandsworth had a poll tax for a couple of years of zero. They didn't pay any. So he pushed it through and then... His council had the lowest in the country, or had zero, zero, in fact. Had zero, and of course there were riots for the poll tax, mm -hmm. um, and that caused lots of problems because, um, and next door to Wandsworth at um, Lambeth, they were paying sort of five, six hundred quid. Um, so that looks to be actually a bribe, uh, bribing the electorate. It looks to be somewhat corrupt to me. Mm. And um, I only found out about Wandsworth being zero recently, but I always knew it was low. That's the reason why I started looking. So when Chope was a bit more visible on Friday. I typed out Chope Wandsworth into Twitter and a tweet came up and I'm not sure if I was prepared for what I read. Mm -hmm. As you know, I'm much more interested in abuse of power, corporate power. What I saw, knowing that Chope, he was the first person to do outsourcing and major austerity in local government cuts, cuts, cuts. So the duty of care that the council has to its residents and vulnerable people, in a way, that cutting attitude, deregulation, that sort of affects that relationship. Of course. They were selling off um, care homes, I would imagine, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, they privatized the bins and they sacked a lot of people, I think 20% of staff. They said they saved a lot of money. Now, somebody wrote a tweet saying this last Friday, Chope, oh him, he's the one who sent me to Kendall House where I was repeatedly drugged and raped. The person who sent that tweet was a woman called Teresa Cooper and she's a well-known families and abuse campaigner. And I contacted her and spoke to her and she told me, that Chris Chope ran Wandsworth Council from 79 to 83, and it was during his tenure in 1981 that she was sent off to Kendall House in Gravesend, which is in Kent, where she was repeatedly um, drugged, experimented on, using all, talks of, all types of psychoactive drugs, and repeatedly raped, um, often by people who she didn't know, who didn't actually work at the care home. In 2010, she was compensated by the Church of England who ran that particular care home and has been. she's been organising getting compensation for some of the other victims. Lots of the people who were in that care home have had birth defects when they've given children and also their children have had children with birth defects. It turns out that in 1980, before she was sent to this care home. There was, in 1979, there are several articles in the newspaper. Cam, mm -hmm. and I, Cam and I just looked at the Church of England document into Kendall House that was released, I think, last year or 2016. And they have a list of all of the newspaper articles talking about zombie children in the care home. Um, and there was an ITV documentary in which I think Sir George Young or Younger was interviewed. He was a minister, uh, was, was interviewed about the use of drugs in care homes on children which that minister defended. And they specifically talk about Kendall House, like they name in a couple of the article titles. They say that it's Kendall House, so it's quite obvious where this is happening. What was the name of the they, doctor? They even interviewed the doctor. I think his mm. name was Perin Bayaga, but he's known as Dr. Perry. They interviewed the doctor, which I haven't actually seen in the video, but it is on YouTube. And you can see also in the document a paper that he's written for the British Medical Journal talking about the experimentation of drugs on... Disturbed girls. On disturbed girls. But reading some of the testimonies of the people who have had experiences, so in this uh, Church of England document, they're getting some testimonies of the people who had their experiences in there, and they say they were not ill and didn't need to be in this care home. They weren't disturbed girls. Mm. So 1979, 78, 79, Chope takes over. These newspaper articles are out there, but Chope is in the mood to cut and 
despite the newspaper articles, and this is in the Times, the Mirror, the News of the World, so it's in the tabloids and the broadsheets, despite all of this, Wandsworth apparently was Kendall House's biggest client, sending girls to Kendall House even after all of these revelations. Now, is this because they wanted to save money? So Chope is outsourcing. That's what he's doing, deregulation, outsourcing, a process that goes on today. That's what Carillion made their money from. This is what the big four accounting firms are preaching. Mm -hmm. This is the doctrine of neoliberalism, capitalism, Thatcher. This is what it's all about. Yeah. Just sell it, get someone else to focus on the problem. Can you tell me a little bit about what you can see from that profile of Christopher Chope, Cam? And that profile, I think, is from around 1993. So we're going through some of the things that uh, Christopher Chope has done throughout his illustrious career. And he was a part of the group called No Turning Back. He's also of the Adam Smith Institute, a supporter and the No Turning Back group of Thatcherites were described as specifically dry and hard economic with hard economic liberal convictions. Private Eye described him as part of the St. Andrews privatisation mafia. Um, that's, and St. Leading... that's St. Andrews University, which is um, sort of a breeding ground for this kind of thing. Right. Michael Fallon went there. Madsen Perry, who set up the um, Madsen Perry, who set up the Adam Smith Institute. So that's kind of the context. Yeah. These, you know, this is sort of the um, yeah where all of the ideas came from. Yeah. And then, I mean, on that Marshall, you kind of heard of some of the things that he voted against. Lots of this might not surprise you in that context. So against the minimum wage, um, against the BBC license fee, he wanted advertising on there. And um, yeah, there's one thing that I wanted to raise here. In January 1984, he visited South Africa as a guest of its apartheid government. So that's quite nice. Okay, and he advocated more trade with the apartheid he South did, Africa. Yes. Yep. And so this is the person who is, I mean, we can talk about procedure later because the way in which he's blocked the upskirting bill is more indicative of how parliament works than it is about his feelings on upskirting, although he clearly has lots of problems in terms of um, the way, the difference between the way he wants the world run and the way it is hopefully going to be. Mm. Um, so yeah, he was a member of the Monday Club when he was at university in the late 60s, along with a man called Harvey Proctor. And John Burko in 1980 or 81, according to Wikipedia, joined the Monday Club when he was uh, at university, age 20. Burko, the current speaker, has turned his back on his views from then, but he was advocating um, mass deportation, repatriation, basically the same as the hostile environment, uh, except for many more people. Now, at that time, 81, 82, that he was advocating that stuff, Harvey Proctor... Um, is another ex-conservative MP who has been accused of paedophilia. Um, he's fought off those claims. Um, and uh, But he was certainly um, reported on as uh, procuring rent boys when he was in Parliament, and I think that's the reason why he lost his seat. Now, Proctor was friends with Neil Hamilton and Christopher Chope, and all of these people had a link with a man called Ian Greer, Ian Greer was one of the original lobbyists. He, um, the whole Cash for Questions debacle from 1994 to 1996, which brought down the major government, this was a case of uh, Ian Greer was a lobbyist. He was getting, uh, he was basically working for several corporations and getting them uh, what they wanted in Parliament. And the idea seems to be that he wasn't just paying MPs, but he was also blackmailing them because... Uh, some people say that there were parties that went on. Um, none of this seems to have been proven, by the way, but um, the links seem to be there uh, according to various websites on the internet, I'm not suggesting that you have to trust them all, but um, uh, to do with paedophilia, basically. I mean, VIP Westminster sex rings with um, young boys have been written about in the Daily Mail, the Mail on Sunday, mm. extensively, and some of the claims are um, have been what's the word, um, debunked thoroughly. Um, but there's still these questions about this this particular group of people and the way that they're lobbying. Um, so yeah, the Monday Club was utterly racist. Um, you have other groups. And so Chope is a part of Leave Means Leave. And um, the, the types of things that they stand for um, are deregulation. And so that's the reason why we started asking these questions. Um, so the OAPs that are being 
killed off now by this so-called new shipment. There's a massive link there with the way in which the child abuse was happening at Kendall House. Um, Teresa Cooper, who spoke to me about this, told me that um, they used a lot of physical force before drugging mm. the residents of that place. And it just so happens that on Friday last week, before the upskirting bill, what happens is one Friday a month in Parliament, uh, private members' bills can be discussed. And there's this concept of filibustering, which is where they don't have a limit on how long you can speak. So you speak for as, until the time stops. So what happened was there was a bill that was being uh, proposed by a man called Steve Reed of Croydon. He said, um, two of my constituents, their son died in a mental health unit and we weren't told why. We got told it was for health reasons and only recently have we managed to get our hands on the autopsy or the post-mortem. So um, they wanted to make it easier for uh, people to get information about deaths in mental health units, but also for mental health units to treat their patients better. And that means reading people their rights before using force. And what happened was, as this debate was uh, started, then this whole filibustering process starts, which is where people start talking, they hog the time and they speak for as long as they can. The person who's most famous for doing that is Philip Davis, mm -hmm. but also Sir Christopher Chope. And the idea is you talk until 2.30 then everybody says, okay, we'll continue next time. What about the rest of the things that we were going to talk about? And then that list gets read out. And if people say, let that proceed to the next stage, it proceeds. If people think it hasn't been discussed enough, then they say, object. <clears throat> and that is all that Chope did. Chope said he objected to something not being debated. And in a way, that's fair enough because things should be debated. Um, and there's a whole list of things that didn't go through. So he filibustered and then objected to it not being debated. Well, he filibustered one debate mm. and then he objected to all of the other debates um, proceeding because quite quite rightly, they should be discussed. But he prevented but them from being the discussed. he's responsible. He's one of the people that was, um, mm. the points that he was making, he could have made them quite quickly. I mean, mm. the way in which, I mean, I suppose the idea is that when you make your objections, you're doing them in a way that you're possibly attempting to persuade other people to see your point of view because either you're amending a new, uh, you're proposing a new law that is amending an old law. Mm. So you're updating an old law and you're saying, hey, I would like this to be taken into account. Now, this law about using force in mental health units, when Chope made one of his contributions to this particular debate, some would argue that he was filibustering, as in playing for time, gamesmanship, um, he said, well, yes, I'm all for the use of force being, um, what's the word, being better policed, mm -hmm. um, you know, for people to know their rights and there to be more people there. And then he said, but obviously in certain cases one has to use chemicals in order to uh, restrain someone and that should not be included in the use of force and the mp who was proposing the bill said well hold on a second you know chemicals means that someone can walk in and you can just drug them and they can die or yeah, you yeah, yeah. isn't that some kind of force in a in a different way well teresa cooper when i told her about his um contribution his intervention she just said well when i when not when he sent me to Kendall House, but when I was sent to Kendall House during the time that he was in charge, mm. um, they used force in order to drug me. You know, so if you say chemicals isn't force, well, the point is to get the chemicals into somebody who doesn't cool. want you to do it. Yeah. You have to sit on them. You have to. She's had her jaw broken um, and various other physical ailments as a result of the physical abuse. Well, doesn't it just that. mean that there's always this this loophole through which? Uh, some kind of force can be applied because, again, reading those testimonies from the Church of England report, they did have force used on them and they were drugged and they um, were test. There's a list of of the kinds of chemicals and drugs that they tested on these um, girls and boys, and they required force to do it. So the idea that you can use a chemical on someone without consent, uh, but not use any force on them, seems it feels like, um, oh, now you have to legislate against something else, but you're always leaving room that's legal within which you might be able to get away with something. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's so totally strategic. And the other thing is, is he saying this because he's actually saying this um, 
on behalf of the drug companies, mm. on behalf of using force, or is he just, you know, wasting everyone's time? Who knows? In a way, he's a winner either way. Um, but yeah, I don't like this guy. I don't think he can be trusted. Yes, it's quite possible that he's against upskirting itself. Um, but at the same time... He said he's not some kind of pervert, I believe. Yeah, exactly. And so he's trying to take a procedural sort of angle. But then when you look how he behaves in some of these places, what he's doing is he's hacking the system. He's clogging it up. And it means that nobody else can get anything done. Hmm. And, and this he, is the point, right? It's all legal, what he's doing. He's just using some kind of leverage within the system uh, that you can't say he's he's breaking any kind of law or breaking procedure. He's following it in a way which means that he can still get what he wants. And yeah, and so it's the philosophy of the loophole lawyer. Mm. You know, he's hacking the system. It's all legal. Um, and that's why people like him should be taken seriously and dealt with only in a kind of legal way. If the rules need to be updated, then people have to all talk to each other and say, how do we deal with this? And that was interesting because on Tuesday, there was an emergency question asked in Parliament about cannabis oil in relation to the taking away of medication from someone who had fits without cannabis oil, a young person. And then second, there was the upskirting bill. And it was very interesting to hear the way in which that was being debated because most of the Labour Party politicians were there saying, oh, Chope is awful. Uh, you know, women MPs saying he's awful and fair enough. Yes, he is. Um, but, you know, let's stay on point with the actual, what are we talking about here? Mm. And sometimes they say, upskirting is awful, he is awful. And then other people would say, what are we going to do about parliamentary procedure? So upskirting bill is being discussed and there's three topics being discussed, just like with Brexit. There's the game and there's the secondary game and there's the tertiary game and there's all these other games going on. Yeah. And it's all just clogging up time and space. And part of you just thinks, can't we just get on a chat room and just like ignore each other if we're not listening to the same subject and just, you know, I'm not saying that's how we have to reform our democracy because it's not up to me, but um, nor do I think that's a good idea. But um, in terms of attention, they're, they're using these techniques of just hacking the attention mm. and then afterwards playing for time. The, just to mention, I sent you a story this week um, about to do with a death tax. I'm not sure if you read it, but just because you mentioned this specific case where someone died in um, a mental hospital and they couldn't figure out why he died. Apparently, I only saw this in the Express and the Daily Mail, the government have pushed through a £100 death tax, which means that if there's some kind of foul play, you need to pay an extra £100 for it to get um, a proper autopsy. And obviously this will affect um, the poorest, the hardest and so on. These are points that they made in the, in the piece. But um, if it's not possible to detect signs of foul play in a, in a basic kind of um, overview or review of, of how someone died and you don't have the money to to pay to see how they actually did die. I mean, that seems a pretty, pretty weird thing to be pushing through. Mm. I mean, obviously they'll say that it's to do with savings and so on. Well, one of the things that Teresa Cooper told me was that, um, so in relation to this story on the front page about how all these people are dying because of a GP that's just knocking them all off, mm. she said that she asked Kent Police um, how many kids have died in care homes, as a, like full stop. Uh, how about that care home over there? And they said, um, you'll have to pay us this much money in order for us to go through our files, which means they're not keeping the numbers. Right. And yeah. so in the, so what she's saying is they're talking about OAPs now and an establishment cover-up of uh, lots of OAP 600 people being killed by this one crazy doctor. But what she's saying is this is going on up and down the country in care homes and they're not keeping Isn't any numbers records? at all. None at all. So again, back to our favourite subject of cover-ups and information politics. There's It's all silence. Then... Yeah, that's that's just one major point that she's making. I mean, she's told me a couple of other stories as well, which are um, sadly believable. Cam? Just another point while we're, we're talking about chemicals. You also sent me a piece to do with knives and chemicals being bought online. Acid, yeah. And it was, I mean, um, Christopher Chope was part of the uh, deregulation task force at one point, and... Right now we have Oliver Letwin, who's been driving lots of the deregulation bill. And Sajid Javid. And Sajid Javid, who have passed, I think it was the 2015 bill, Oliver Letwin, that passed the allowing acid to be sold a bit more freely. And then we saw like a bit of a rise in acid attacks. And I think there was one piece I saw in The Independent mm. that linked it back to Oliver Letwin. The deregulation and bill, And the deregulation yeah. bill. Um, now, Trope is another deregulator. and Hardcore. Here he is making sure that 
we can get these these unregulated, untested chemicals through and test them on people and use them by force in a sense. Um, well, yeah, I mean, in a way, I suppose, again, with all these things, it's easy to say it in one simple sentence, but yeah, the system is being created by him mm. or he's contributing to it. Obviously, he doesn't control everything, but you can see he's just dislodging every little bit of safety that's there yeah. in order to ultimately have... Um, harder chemicals coming in from the US or even from, you know, like Europe or wherever else, but, you know, um, less regulation coming in and then eventually being used on UK uh, patients. And so that's what Therese Cooper is also saying, you know, no one is monitoring what's happened to these patients. They're not monitoring um, how many are dying, how they're being killed. They're being restrained, asphyxiated and all this type of stuff. And so it all links in with what he was filibustering, the use of force in mental health mm. units. The second thing that was going to be debated that got, that obviously didn't get nodded through was Andy Slaughter, MP for Hammersmith, where Charing Cross Hospital is um, in London. And that was something which I've advocated myself. And funnily enough, Chris Chope himself has put a private member's bill advocating this as well. Which, no. Yeah, I'm not joking. This is If you read the 47 bills, you'll see one. And I actually totally agree with Chope's bill on this one. And it was for FOI, Freedom of Information, to apply to any private company that has a deal with the government. Yeah. So PFI, housing associations, any of that stuff. Yeah, Chope has actually put an identical bill there. I almost I'd, don't believe it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why, um, but he has. He, we interviewed Maurice Frankel from the campaign for Freedom of Information, and he told us he was putting forward this bill. With Andy Slaughter. With Andy Slaughter, and that seems to have been stopped now. Well, it's been put back. So that's so it would have been going through now uh, at the same time as the upskirting bill, but because Mrs. May has decided the upskirting bill is what she stands for, she's decided to push that. And, of course, Andy Slaughter's will never get that attention. Yeah. So, so the use of force in mental health units has to wait. The FOI has to wait, even though FOI for um, private companies is at the root of getting rid of corruption in this country. Obviously, May won't get behind it. Now, this is the type of thing that we, me and you, Cam, should be making it a lot more noise about. Obviously, we should be interviewing Teresa Cooper as soon as we can um, and just to get her insights. Uh, I mean, she's basically sort of like a magnet for whistleblowers in, in um, mm. the care home system and that sort of thing. She's got a lot of stories. And in the same way, the Andy Slaughter FOI thing, because it's linked to what Teresa's been doing, Teresa Cooper. In a way, I was saying this is a tale of two Teresas. Um, in 1981, Teresa Cooper is sent to Kendall House. In 1981, what's Theresa May doing? Sadly, her father dies in a car crash in 1981, Theresa May. At that time, she's working for the Bank of England. And um, before then, I think around 1985, becoming a councillor in the London Borough of Merton. Wimbledon is in the Borough of Merton. It's next to Wandsworth. I'm quite sure that May and Chope will have met at some point in these types of periods. Now, another friend that Chope had was Eric Pickles. Mm. Eric Pickles, who was known as being the Minister for Local Government during the time of austerity. So again, do you remember how we were talking about deregulation and child abuse? Well, the deregulation bill has a clause in it. I mean, this is obviously ultra geeky and very few people would ever say this, but at the time I looked into it, there's a clause in that which talks about the privatization of child care. Um, sorry, what is it? Um, care of children, care homes, basically, children's care homes, um, so that the likes of Virgin can come in. I can't remember if that particularly went through, but um, yeah, that's the deregulation bill from Cameron days. And Pickles was there doing austerity mm. and just cutting, cutting, cutting. And everybody knows that all these local governments have had a huge budget budget cut. Pickles was copying... He got rid of the audit commission, didn't he? So it's yeah. removing checks and balances in terms of going yeah. out and checking on those local yeah, councils. Exactly. The audit commission was supposed to check that everyone's doing their job and the money's mm. being spent properly and there's no corners being cut. And that was up since 1985, I think. And nobody thought it was supposed... It would do a good job. Everyone just thought it was just a kind of fig leaf. Uh, but actually it did occasionally do something. Yeah. And they, yeah, they got rid of that, I think 2013, possibly 2015. Then after that, yeah. But the thing is, Pickles in eight, in the 
in the early 80s, he's friends with Chope, looking at what Chope is doing in Wandsworth, cutting everything. He's inspired. Pickles is up in Bradford, and he becomes the equivalent of the mayor of Bradford or the, the leader of Bradford, and so he has this policy of Bradford PLC. The Tories are obviously shedding votes in the north, and he finds a way of just revolutionising, turning into Bradford PLC, turning Bradford into a corporation, mm -hmm. and somehow being the leader and doing all of this. And so he got voted back in, and basically Tories ended up doing really well. So he became a hero, Pickles. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to stress that relationship that they have. Yeah. And I remember Clive Lewis tweeting um, that Eric Pickles had said that regulations were communist, uh, to which I think someone replied, uh, the Ten Commandments are regulations, and Jesus isn't even a Marxist. <laughs> um, but... That kind of it was an insight into what kind what he thinks about checks and balances and rules. And here you have this kind of who you've mentioned Chope, Pickles, May, Davies, the ways in which they interact with each other in the system to create the outcomes that we are seeing in our society. And those things aren't ever really joined up. Yeah. Um the yeah, as you said, they say they don't like regulations, but at the same time they're pushing everyone around. And <laughs> And I think the, the pattern that we always see is that, you know, they say they want to get rid of regulations, but then afterwards what they bring in is often more paperwork. Everyone, yeah. get, everyone gets confused by the tyranny of the paper, the bureaucracy, and then afterwards there's some other agenda that gets pursued. Um, so, yeah, that's pickles. And I just, I keep thinking about the link between Chope and all of this child abuse, which is basically paedophilia. I'm not saying that he did it directly, but as I said, it's been reported on that the overdrugging is happening, that there's abuse in child uh, children's care homes. It's just not his priority. And in the same way with the way in which Pickles has, has been pushing all of the cuts in local government, the demotivation that will happen with the staff mm -hmm. who are losing their jobs and everything like that, I mean that they're going to care about looking after these kids far less than ever before, and old people. Of course. So you're going to have all these old people be just being killed off. You're going to have all of these kids just being abused mm. because all of these cuts are happening and they're getting away with it. So I just, what this can I say? This is their modus operandi. They're using them as as um, experimentation for the for the for the drugs and all of this other stuff. They're just medicating these people and just keeping them. Um, away. So, you know, with benefit cap and things like that as well, yeah. it, you know, 15 hours, if you work more than 15 hours, then afterwards you lose your benefits, all of these other things, just making sure that the drug companies make the money, all these other stuff. So I know I probably sound like I'm some kind of a <laughs> Trump-esque Alex Jones pattern noticer or whatever else. Mm. But um, I think it's important to talk about the the relationship between deregulation and obviously when they come out and say, oh, you know, we're going to make it easier for business. It's so, it's going to create so much growth. We never talk about the downside costs. Like what happens when you stress out all your staff? What happens when none of them are motivated to work and you're pulling out all of the money from public services where vulnerable kids or old people or whatever are being looked after? And then also you're pushing the idea of growth so much that you will actually allow in people to test on these people you know these are the silences that exist these is we don't look at those costs and really when you when we are talking about deregulation in we should be talking about what are the costs of taking away those protections yeah and just a very concrete thing of what degree are you actually using drugs on kids and is anyone actually checking this mm. um it looks like they're not and i think the chances of dying in care um yeah i mean and then you have these media cover-ups so Sky, they were presenting it as though Chope is just a dinosaur and that he objects to private members' yeah, bills, okay. yeah. even though he's laid down 47 private members' bills. Um, he said it's not fair and, you know, we need to have a discussion about private members' bills. Okay, so let's have that discussion. Um, how are we going to have that discussion? The impression I get is that Philip Davis, and you can say, <laughs> yeah. say something about him in a minute, Philip Davis of Shipley, which is next to Bradford, um, he's known as one of the filibustering people yeah. who talks things out so that basically uh, new laws can't come in from people who aren't the government. So they make it look as though they are uh, on the awkward squad, loony part of the Conservative Party. But what they're doing is they're creating a system where only the government stuff goes through. And anyone who has a good idea that's not in the government, be it they or anyone else, anything that they want to do never actually moves forward. So uh, it's, it's a kind of fascistic 
way of mm. controlling what goes through and they can paint themselves as the bad people. Yeah. So that means that they have a lot more backing for this because if only one or two people have to do it, yeah. then they can have lots of people wanting it blocked, but just one or two people being the public face and them it's having true. having the, the kind of balls or the communication skills to be able to just say, well, actually, it's like Kate Andrews the other day. Institute of Economic Affairs. Somebody says, so where'd you get your money from then, Institute of Economic Affairs? Because we know you're opaque and we know that you're probably funded by tobacco or whoever else, possibly Michael Ashcroft, billionaires. God knows mm -hmm. we're asking. And she said, oh, what you're suggesting is a violation of GDPR. And GDPR, which is an EU law talking about data protection. This is a woman who advocates leaving the EU, using the EU as an excuse. She says there's too much regulation and now she uses it as an excuse. Um, Andy Wigmore from Friends with Aaron course, Banks. By the way, there are plenty of think tanks that do reveal their funders and there's no problem with GDPR. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> so Aaron Banks, the, the Brexit guy, he, um, Andy Wigmore, you know, people ask the same thing and he's just said, yeah, GDPR. So they're basically doing whatever they can to hide behind these things. So what I'm saying is that Andy Wigmore from Leave EU, Aaron Banks, Kate Andrews, F Chope, Davis... I get the impression that these people are just there to take up as much time and attention as possible, soak up the irritation factor, wind you up, and then afterwards divert and distract people from what needs to be done, yeah. such as passing a law that would make freedom of information requests apply to private companies or housing associations. So they're trying to prevent real information from coming out by making it look as though they're just civilized, following the rules and expecting everyone else to. Yeah. Um, we even said, we saw a meme released by the Ministry of Justice that said, you know, upskirting is, is awful and we're totally against it. And, you know, how quickly this kind of PR thing goes into it. So now, like, Theresa May is like, we're going to push it through anyway. We're so progressive. And, it, you know, we're talking about upskirting, which really, you know, if we were living in a better world, we wouldn't even have to kind of discuss. And instead, the... I'm not saying it's not important. There have been horrible, horrible instances of it happening. But um, the way that it's now being used by the Tory party is to say, look, we're really we're, we're going to push it through anyway because we're really good um, and ignore the question about how Chope still got knighted. Yeah, exactly. Upskirting is a marketing opportunity for her at the end of Mar on Sunday. Mm. And whenever he said, why did you knight? She just said he's a long serving MP. So what that means is they've got dirt on me. I've got dirt on them. We're more. Yeah, I can't make any progress without helping this guy. And if you look at the different relationships, as we said before, Burko, the speaker, nominated Chope to be knighted and Chope blocked the investigation into Burko for bullying. And now Burko, who used to be a member of the Monday Club, which said, let's deport all foreigners, Burko is now the one who gets the veto on Brexit. So Burko, who said he was a Remainer all of this time, one thing is for sure in politics, most people in there are willing to drop their principles at the drop of a hat. Yeah. So Burko, who claims to be a rampant Remainer, right now, he might just go back to his more uh, racist days and just say, you know, let's just go for the hardest Brexit possible. Or more to the point, however crap Theresa May gets the deal, I'm the one who chooses. So what I propose is this. Burko, you have all of this power invested in you. Um, it, maybe it's time that, um, yeah, some pressure is applied to you. Now, it is already being applied definitely, to you. Definitely, definitely. But that's the question, you know, can he handle it? I think he can because, you know, these people are all versed in the art of bullshit. But where do we... Um, where does it go? So is he going to be the only, is it going to be like TTIP where he's the only person that gets to read the agreement and then just tick it, sign it off? Yeah, yeah. You know, this is the kind of administrative bureaucratic thing that we're having here where it's like he's marking everyone's homework. He's yeah. going to, he's going to mark Theresa's negotiation homework and say, oh yeah, that's fine. And don't forget, I was just being, you know, prosecuted for bullying, but don't worry because choked saved my ass. Yeah. I mean, that is quite a cycle. It's quite an organogram of power. And it's become, it's come up, this is another thing raised by the Daily Mail, was that it's tomorrow is the day that would be nine years that he's been in a speaker. And he said at the beginning of his, um, you know, his, his residency that he would only stay for a maximum of nine years and that runs out tomorrow. And he's changed his mind. He said, yeah, I'm going to do mind. another five. Yeah. Another five will be all right. Yeah. Um, 
And I wouldn't have had a problem with that until I found this stuff out. Yeah. You know, um, I don't mind him coming out with all that racist stuff in the 80s and changing his mind. But the bit that you suddenly realize he's gone transactional. Yeah. He's supposedly a Remainer. The other guy's leave means leave. Oh, the other thing, Philip Davis, he was very clever. Again, the filibuster Brexiteer guy. Lives with Esther Lives McVeigh. with Esther McVeigh, who runs the DWP. Mm-hmm. He said, can the speaker... So he gets... Uh, I, I thought... I didn't realize he was talking to his mate. He goes, can the speaker please confirm that we cannot be blamed for upskirting not going through? Because we just spoke for the debate... And afterwards, there were like 10 other topics that were on the um, order paper. The next one was FOI, and upskirting was number five or number six. Can the speaker confirm that there was no way that upskirting was ever going to go to the next stage on Friday? And um, the speaker said this, I would just like to say thank you to the honourable gentleman, Mr. Ship, you know, of Shipley, um, what's his name, Philip Davis of mm. Shipley. Thank you to him for giving me this question in advance. So I've been able to do my research. Fine, fair enough. And I've been able to say that, yes, um, the second thing was FOI. Um, upskirting was the fifth one. There's no way, this has never happened, it would have been a precedent because it's never happened before that the fifth one has gone through um, and it wouldn't have happened on this occasion. And that is true, but... You know, all the deals have been done in the background, yeah. you know, behind the scenes, because you can see they've agreed this question. They're getting themselves out of jail. Anyone in history, you know, anyone in the future who looks at the history and looks at the Hansard will just see this ping pong match where everything's clean. They've cleaned it up yeah. even before um, they've sanitized everything that they've done. Mm-hmm. And so in history, it will just look as though everyone tried, but it just couldn't get through. And then Teresa came and saved the day. So like yeah, I said, at yeah. five o'clock, David Gorker is going to be pushing upskirting and w- waving the flag for feminism, uh, whatever they want to call it. But in actual fact, it's all part of turning Britain into a post-Brexit dirty money playground. Yeah. It's you interesting know. that it's all within this um, kind of respectability, you know, like respectability politics. I was watching this video earlier about um, a black woman who's being harassed and the guy was she was being harassed by a white dude and she reported it to the hotel where they were both guests and the and the, the white guy was like hey calm down what's the problem and then she seemed like the unreasonable irritated woman <clears throat> and he seemed like the sensible calm guy and he was allowed to go and it's interesting that you require people to kind of play this respectability politics but within that you have all these people who understand how to leverage all that so even if you're kind of playing that game you don't know where you get to kind of uh, take an advantage here because it's all done within that scene, right? <laughs> like, um, what does Immortal Technique say? He says, uh, a real gangster makes you take his money. That's what banks do, right? They make you take their money. Like, it's all within this legal system. That's where, like, the biggest and un- most unaccountable, like, you can't put your finger on these kinds of things that they're doing. Well, it's behaviour. So if we set up a system in which everybody behaves according to certain norms, I create the norms... And then mm. afterwards, your behavior becomes predictable. And yeah. if your behavior becomes predictable, then I know that if I do this and that and this and that, then over time, that won't be questioned. That won't be questioned because your behavior has become so predictable. It's very unlikely that you could have stepped way outside of that. So someone like Teresa Cooper has been a victim of the outsourcing, the deregulation, the uh, drug experimentation, the child abuse. The removal uh, of checks and balances in local yeah, areas. All of that, but she stepped way outside outside all of that and she's found all the information with the Kent police, everybody trying to undermine her and, and she's managed to get the Church of England to admit and do a full-on inquiry. Um, but that is only because she stepped right outside. So she told me earlier on today on the phone that what's happening with her is that she's learned how to understand people's behavior. And it's only when you understand people's behavior or you start understanding how people are behaving that you can learn how to operate. So I'm hoping to get her to tell us more about the story itself, the implications for today, but also um, what she's learned about how to find information and how to basically get justice for not just herself Mm. but other people. Because she believes some of that stuff is still going on now. And the piece you were talking about with the OAPs, this, I think they call, like, a nickname is Dr. O- Dr. Opiate is the name of this woman, of this doctor. And 
you know, obviously they're saying that she's retired with a really fat NHS pension and she's, you know, got a house over here and a house over there. And it's 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 interesting to understand why can't we we can point at her. We know who she is. We know where she is. We know that she's got two houses, but we can't get her to go to jail for for this. It's just. Yeah. Well, and I, mean, it's, I, suppose, and I mean, obviously I the government is also working. It's procedure now, isn't it? Yeah. It's procedure, so it will come out and mm. stuff like that. Well, look at Chope. I mean, it's 40, 35 years since, 40 years since he's done what he did at Wandsworth. And he was lauded for it. He got an OBE for services to local government. Was yeah. that, I mean, I, I would suggest to you that possibly that's an OBE for child abuse. You know, I mean, I mean, not OBE for child abuse. Maybe for is the wrong word because, you know. Yeah, we can't say he knew, but if he didn't know... He probably shouldn't be in his position. Yeah. Um, the child abuse definitely happened. They were being drugged up. He was That's, being reported on. Yeah. And um, and he gets an OB and now he's knighted. So why isn't he going to be as obnoxious as, as they come? Mm-hmm. If all this stuff has happened, Wandsworth have never apologised to Teresa for what they did. Teresa Cooper. And in fact, she told me that they've taken out insurance against child abuse, which actually prevents them from ever having to apologise. Um, and that sort of thing. Um, there's also ecclesiastical insurance against child abuse as well. So that means that they all see it coming, How and then afterwards, that? it's in their business interest to cover it up. I think that what we've, a product! I what think, a financial product! I think it's time that we started winding up. But just also to say that um, you've got conservative way forward, the ninety two club, no turning back. All of these companies or think tanks coming out of Tufton Street. There's a whole network of power of entities that are doing this. And so when Sajid Javed. And um, Sajid Javid said, oh, my young daughters would be really ha- unhappy at the way the upskirting bill has mm. been blocked. But he is an honorary vice president of the Conservative Way Forward think tank, along with Sir Christopher Chope. And he hasn't exactly quit. Nope. So all of these, I mean, that's just one example of double standards. Either way, obviously, I'm somewhat irate about all of this stuff. And I think I'm going to stop talking now because um, we've got to get on with pushing some more information out online. Okay, yep. Is that everything that you've got? Um, yeah, I think we've been probably 45 minutes already. So. We need to get this out in time for the upskirting debate. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Talk soon, everybody. Bye. Bye.